Hello? Hello? Um, my name is Uldis Zarins, for those who know my books. Um, then uh, probably my name is, uh, is already known. And um, I'm the author of three books. Probably you know, like most of you know, this book, Anatomy for Sculptors. Uh, that's like the most famous of, of the ones that I wrote. The second is uh, Anatomy of Facial Expression. And the third is Head and Neck, the form of the head and neck. This is like a little bit more advanced, kind of overlaps with the previous speaker. And I um, appreciate the work you do, like, like very good work. And uh, I'm the big uh, kind of like advocate of the, of the blockouts and, uh, and kind of like uh, thinking geometrically and, uh, and not going into the very small details. And also, if you give structure to the head, it's always good because in the end, you kind of you can appreciate it because it's not like kind of blob, but it keeps together. So today's topic is very much overlaps the previous lecture because like the le previous lecture was more about like practically how you apply this knowledge. And I will tell you a little bit more about like the theoretical part and more about like my philosophy and why I'm so much obsessed about like the blockouts and stuff. And um, uh, actually, I kind of like, uh, uh, I, I cannot imagine myself sculpting and speaking at the same time because when I do sculpting, I just quiet. I cannot even reply uh, phone calls. I just like, huh? Because there is no way to sculpt and, and speak. So that's like the great talent that you have. So very much appreciated. So today's topic is a form of the head and neck, more like a block out like philosophy and stuff. And I always start with my method and with my philosophy, like, why block out uh, for those who kind of using even block outs they sometimes they just kind of don't realize why they do it and they don't kind of they don't think about those things so like i used to you know um, struggle with the philosophy too much maybe and um, like the world is uh, uh, can be can be looked in two directions. So there is this natural world, which is which is like a like a chaotic and overwhelming. There's a lot of organic forms, and as uh, as uh, as long as we don't have to sculpt it, it's okay, because there is too much information to understand. But then you start to sculpt a human form or animal form, and human form especially because if you make a mistake in a human form, everybody can see it right away. So every little thing that you, 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 you make wrong, everybody can understand immediately. So you kind of want to kind of uh, cognitively understand what you're doing. So not only sculpting, because sometimes you're just wasting your time by making lines and strokes and making, and then in the end you somehow manage it to the end and it looks fine. But sometimes you're just struggling, 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 and it only gets worse and worse and worse. And you just want to understand what do you do wrong, you know? And if you look at, at this chaotic, overwhelming reality, uh, then it's very hard to organize it. And uh, if you look in the other end of the spectrum, uh, that's an order, you know? That's like the very huma humane thing, so to organize things. Uh, and, and those are like the two extremes. This extreme is uh, too organized and is boring in some sense. And that extreme is still kind of uh, like uh, undefined. And I think the art is somewhere in between those things. So basically the artist is not the documentalist. So you don't, you don't document reality. You interpret it. You interpret it. So, so that's why art happens somewhere over there. So basically you take geometric forms that you understand and you somehow uh, organize them in some organic way, but still keeping that form intact. So that's, that's my understanding. So you always have to deal with this uh, chaos of reality. And uh, therefore, when you create the, the head, like you uh, noticed from the previous lecture, uh, there is multiple ways how to deal with this, uh, this uh, undefined uh, organic world. And uh, one thing is blockouts. Those are, as I mentioned before, and the previous lecture you saw it as well. So, and uh, I divide them in multiple levels. It doesn't mean that you really have to follow those levels. You know, I kind of, uh, uh, I'm jealous if somebody can really maintain this block out thing like you all the way the the, the, the sculpting process. Usually, you start with the with the, the block out, and then you just lost in the organic world or something, and then you try to keep back, and then sometimes you manage, sometimes you don't. And if you divide it into the, like, let's say four levels, the first level is like 
like a helmet head, you know, and the fourth level is like organic, and then you have two more levels in between. So it, as, I, as, as I always like disclaim, you don't really have to go all four levels. You just have to keep them in mind that there is such thing exists. Maybe there's only three levels. Maybe there's 17 levels. You don't know. But anyway, um, when you look at the, a human face, uh, it's good to uh, hold and somehow keep that structure intact because uh, it's easier to not to lost. You know, it's sometimes when you when you go into the strange strange place and then you just okay, you first time in Amsterdam and then you say, okay, I saw this building once, so uh, when I see this building, I know I have to turn right. And then you see another building. Wait a minute, this building looks very similar to that building. Oh, and that too. So there's so many similar buildings. So you have to build your own kind of like system to navigate in this like organic uh, complex world. And th therefore these levels kind of uh, are, very, are very handy. So this, I, this is another disc disclaimer. These are not uh, like this, that's not the topology, okay? Those are the guidelines to understand the form. So that's, what, that's how I do. I'm very bad in 3D, honestly, you know? Uh, I'm, I came here to a Blender conference and then I say I, I don't know much about 3D even though I sculpt a lot 3D but it's more like I have to because otherwise uh, it's very hard to survive in this world but I'm very bad so uh, I did it in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Illustrator like most of the uh, most of the you know I know how to draw because I'm classically trained and I can cheat so and, and, and I'm a sculptor, so I can understand the form and I can draw the lines. So basically you take Illustrator and bam, and, and there you are. And uh, it's all blocked out. And then I give to my 3D artists and they go like, oh my God, how can I sculpt it in, in a blender? And so, so um, the first level, I always give this picture with the two uh, kind of uh, two approaches. There is like a two approaches. One is, uh, is uh, the egg head, another one is helmet head, you know? It, it doesn't mean that there is only two approaches. It means that you can pick and choose any of those who, want, who you want. Sometimes people like one, sometimes they like the, the second, sometimes they like the third, which I didn't show. You have your own way. That's about like the first level. And uh, where these two, and there's little history and little, little background, you know. Now it's like widely circulating in, into the, into the uh, 3D community, this idea about like the helmet head and blah, blah, blah. But there is history. There is some person in history who started this thing, you know. And there's like two significant uh, personalities that I wanted to mention when we talk about the first block. One is Gottfried Bammes. Maybe uh, some of you know, some of you know the Gottfried Bammes. I think that's my favorite, uh, that's my favorite uh, uh, pla plastic, uh, how you call it, like art uh, anatomy guy. He's a German. Um, he died recently, 2007. For me, it's recently because I'm too old. Uh, and there's another one, which is uh, Andrew Loomis, and he's the guy from 30s, from America. He is the one who created the kind of the learning system to produce more and more artists for the um, advertisement industry. So it's another extreme. But he developed a very quick way how to, how to shape the basic shapes of the head. So basically what I did, I kind of made, uh, uh, made uh, some, some, somewhere in between and use for myself. So a little bit about, about Andrew Loomis. You probably know this idea that you have this helmet head and then you wide, basically that's a sphere, then you chop off the, the, the temples, then you had this, you know, and then you, from the center of the sphere, you draw the line, that's the bro line for the mouth, it's all kind of very easy and, and uh, simple. And in, uh, also in drawing, they, they kind of use it a lot, this helmet head idea. Basically, you have to start from something. And if that something is good, then it's easier to start. Basically, you don't, uh, until this point, you don't think, you just make helmet with these proportions, as you mentioned, this kind of elongated proportions. And then it's a good start. You basically kind of, you get, you get rid of this basic anxiety because when you start a new project, you always have this nervousness and anxiety. You have to start. And when you start with the helmet, that you already have half of the anxiety is gone. And then you can do more work on more on details. And then there is a, a Gottfried Bammes method. Then you just take kind of like an egg shape and then you chop it off similarly like Andrew Loomis. And then, uh, and then you basically, uh, then, then you're done, you know. <laughs> You all know this. Uh, I always get complaints in my lectures because I'm lecturing in academy and always get these complaints from students like, man, it's easy to say. I mean, like you have to do. And uh, honestly, I have 40 hours, 40 hours of lectures of the human anatomy, 40 hours, you know. And then 
somebody explains anatomy in one hour here. You know, it's like one forty of the information. So there is so much information that basically, when you look that somebody is just sculpting, you really get in, in, you get anxiety because there is so much information just like packed in this little little bit. Then you kind of uh, uh, very um, it makes you shivering. But uh, I'll try to kind of lead you out from this anxiety with some tricks, at least some tricks and try to not to overwhelm you with too much information because when you get too much information then you then it's then you don't get any information you know there is some limits there's a red line when you go across the red line then it's then you zero again so the skull can be divided into two parts in uh, in um, in medical anatomy it's called uh, uh, neurocranium and the viscerocranium uh, we call it brain case and the facial skeleton uh, division is not precisely like in a medical anatomy, but very similar. So there is basically the place where you have brain and then the place where the face is connected to. And it's the same thing with uh, with this cylinder and uh, and the egg that I explained to you before. So we have this, these two skeletons, these two places. The problem with this thing is that this this these proportions they are changing. Yeah, during the lifetime, uh, proportions in between the the facial skeleton. And um, and uh, the facial skeleton and uh, and uh, the brain case they change, and uh, you have to understand that these proportions, like I, I show you, this egg shape and the facial skeleton, they can be applied for the adult, male adult, more likely male, because you know they the proportions one to one point five, you know. But when you're born, you have one to three. So you have a huge brain case and almost no face, you know? <laughs> Sounds funny, right? But, but if you measure, it is so. And then when you look at the whole proportions of the, of, the, of the baby, you have like a huge head and then something hanging from it, you know? <laughs> because you have to get through, you know? If you have to get through, you, don't, you shouldn't have like shoulders or something like that. So. Uh, basically, uh, you need brain to develop the rest of the body. So you, you get like the basic information, you're born, and then you start developing all the rest of the body. And the face is, believe me, it's not so important when you're born. And also jaws, you don't need jaws because you don't have teeth, you don't have like any kind of food. You just need to, you know, eating breast and that's pretty much what you need. You need just opening and that's it. And maybe you need to learn to smile. Uh, as quickly as possible because in case if the male comes home and then he has some kind of like confusion and doubts that is it his child or not you have to smile and when you smile problem solved so the male is getting a oh, such a beautiful smile and you're safe <laughs> then you grow up and then your facial skeleton start growing because there is a two functions of the face one is social function and the second thing is eating you know you need to eat you need to digest food so you need some some masseters and temporal muscle, all kinds of like, uh, uh, you know, eating muscles, so-called, yeah, uh, and and social interaction, but not so much social interaction when you're adult. When you're adult, you need to make these all affairs and all crazy like, you know, uh, scenes and and dramas and and that. then you really need face, and also you need very like very strong jaws in case uh, if there is some uh, meat to to grind. And then when you get older, the brain, as you see, is the same, uh, the brain case size, but the face is kind of shrinks and it usually it shrinks because of the teeth, because you lose teeth, teeth and, uh, and then, then, then you just, and I'll talk later a little bit about like the mechanics of the, of the jaws and why when you get older, you get smaller face. Uh, and then, of course, if you're a beginner, you are not beginners. So you're all professional artists. There is not basically, uh, I'm not addressing you, but sometimes they, you know, the students in academy, they have this question, why there is, why you are so much obsessed about these bones? Because we don't see bones. Bones are inside. Why you want to know, why we should know about, about the bones? Because we have flesh on top. Haven't seen that? I mean, like, skull, you know, why skull? And uh, the, my reply is, but, well, you have to think about the skull as a basic structure because like soft tissue changes and moving. And there was this good, uh, uh, good idea about like the, the skin and the soft tissue slides over the skull. And by sliding over the skull, you can really see the structures uh, underneath. So that's why if you build wrong skull, you probably will build this wrong soft tissue. Well, 
um, there is one moving part of the skull. It's the, the, the mandible. So you don't want to neglect that one. I'm cheating in this, in this picture. I'm cheating. So it's, it doesn't move. Yeah, I bet it moves. Uh, sometimes I get these complaints. <coughs> so skull is not soft, except these uh, heavy metal skulls. They are kind of soft. <laughs> they, they can make expressions and stuff. But the, in reality, so, like skulls, they don't, they don't make angry faces. <coughs> That's why if I see like the zombie movies, I just can't watch them because like I'm always thinking about the cartilages and connective tissue and bones and innervations and uh, and blood supplies and all these kind of things that makes mo people move. And then I just can't enjoy the zombie movies. That's the problem. That's my kind of like a, um, a professional cretinism, as we used to call it. I don't know. Maybe that's not political uh, politically correct word. So the bony structure is almost like a hanger in 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 the in the in the closet. So basically, you have soft tissue, which is your, you know, uh, jumper, and then you have this hanger, which is bone, and and of course we want to put it on a hanger because if we don't, then probably the shape in the morning can be different, you know, and the same thing with the face. So you always want to have skull underneath, just in case if you wake up in the morning and there is no skull and it's, everything is wrinkled and. <laughs> That's why you always can blame on the pillow if you have wrinkles and uh, folds when you get older. Uh, so a little bit, a little bit of anatomy, just not too much, but a little bit, just a little tiny intro about. Um, so we have a skull, and uh, of course uh, uh, we have skull. It is like the the, the heart tissue and heart tissue and the like bone, like the teeth are not bone, which is kind of a surprising thing. It looks very bony, but it's not bone. So we have bone and teeth. Then we have soft tissue, which is muscle, fat, and skin, which is laying on top of it. And then we have connective tissue, basically that connects the soft tissue with hard tissue. That's basically most of the work what it does. There's some more uh, use for the connective tissue, but I'm not going to go as deep now, but still. Interesting. And what kind of connective tissue we have? Cartilages, ligaments, and tendons. You know. And if you look at the face, uh, you can always see some marks, like bony landmarks, uh, like a bone, bone kind of pushing to the skin and always visible. And we can always rely on those bony landmarks when we're thinking about the, the skull underneath and how it's constructed. So there are some places where you always have to look for those bony landmarks. And uh, I'll be talking about those bony landmarks a little bit, just some sort of a, like an intro in the bony landmarks. And, um, and I hope it will be some, uh, some good, uh, good uh, ap uh, application. Uh, I know you're all professionals, you all know these things, you know, you all read my books and went to academies and uh, studied yourself and you all know better than me sometimes. And I'm not going to teach you anything new, but Anyway, I'm here, and so I can explain you some things that I discovered and uh, thinking uh, it's important. Can you see these blue and red lines here? Uh, it's kind of not very visible, but still can see. So these are the outlines of the soft tissue and the bone. And the thing is that the form of the skull, the form of the bone, uh, very much uh, uh, influences the, the soft tissue. So there is this uh, technique, uh, forensic anthropology reconstruction, reconstruction from the from the skull. And we hear about it. There is this guy Gerasimov. He not he is not there. He was there like uh, 70 years ago. So he discovered the relationship between the bone and the soft tissue. So whenever you find a skull, uh, in some level of precision, you can reconstruct, uh, reconstruct uh, like the soft tissue. And then later there is other techniques that have been developed, especially in Britain and USA. And the facial recognition, recognition, uh, this uh, forensic uh, reconstruction is kind of like a, it's a whole like science. And there's a, a institute, uh, Liverpool Art Institute, and they do a lot of uh, these kind of digital nowadays. Not anymore like physical with the clay, but digital. So there's a uh, plenty of very good work done. So that's just kind of what I wanted to show you. Just proves the idea that the soft tissue and hard tissue they are very much connected, and you always have to be very about one another thing. So we'll talk about a little bit about the land, uh, bony landmarks. I already mentioned the Amsterdam and the situation when you're walking on Amsterdam and then you kind of like uh, rely on some Im like a very significant building. So you make a circle. Oh, I've been here already. Yeah, I know this shop, you know, and then, okay, I'll set this tower as a landmark. Uh, let's say in, in Paris, we have uh, uh, we have 
Eiffel Tower, and, uh, and in other cities we have some other tall buildings that we can see from the distance. So you always can measure the distances and the place just based on these uh, landmarks. And same thing with the body. And why these landmarks are important. Uh, have you been in a train that you can see only one side of the train and that the one train is moving and you have this feeling that you are moving and then the train is gone and you're like, wait a minute, why we stopped? Because you were thinking that the train was passing you was standing and you are moving. So that's why you always want to understand which parts are not moving and which parts are soft and, and variable and moving. So that's why in my uh, uh, understanding, the bony landmarks are the, the very good, very good um, uh, points to, uh, to rely on. So this is data from the hospital. Uh, um, it's legal, you know, it's depersonalized. There is no, nobody, nobody knows who this guy is. So I got it from hospital and I made this bone and the soft tissue in different colors and made like the skin trans kind of semi-transparent so you can see the bone. And just pay attention how much bone influences the form, you know, and in, in the places where there's more red, there's a deep, like a thicker soft tissue. And where is the yellow, the bone is much more closer to the to the surface so you always have to think about the bone so you don't want to uh, forget it and um, let's uh, hit the road then parietal bone all these complicated words and i know you don't have enough time and power to remember all these names just forget it just uh, just try to kind of enjoy so why i mentioned this bone mm, because on the parietal bone there is so-called parietal eminences and those are the widest parts of the head so basically before you even start the block out you always understand okay the widest part of the of the head is is on the parietal bone so how to find this highest this uh, biggest uh, dimension uh, well you just go from the ear and a little bit back that's it you found the parietal eminence uh, and of course already mentioned the head is not round if you look from the from the from the top the, the 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 forehead part is a little bit more tapered so it's almost like an egg shape so that's why Gottfried Bam is, is using egg because the front side is a little bit tapered and uh, in this picture you can see it quite uh, vividly you can see the face is much smaller than the back and on adults it is the same but maybe less pronounced but you can always see it on a except if you break your uh, cephalic uh, brachiocephalic, that's the type of the skull uh, in some parts of the world. Uh, people have more rounded heads and some people have more flattened, more narrow. So there is like a division in three parts. This is coming from those dark times when they were measuring with the circles heads. So you don't want to show this information to very dangerous people. So you ha always have to be careful. This is a uh, very, very specific information. People start dividing people in uh, head, head shapes and started treating them differently. So you always have to be careful with these kind of anthropometric and anthropological information. That's why these information you don't want to let go out. So that's why in internet also it's kind of limited access to these kind of things. But anyways, for you as an artist, these things have to, you, you have to know that there is these types. And uh, I also teach the, the ethnic uh, anthrop anthropology, like ent ethnic uh, morphology. So I explain the difference between different nations. And again, it's very specific uh, inside information just for you guys, because when you as an artist, you have to understand one population differs from other population in a general, you know, in a general uh, in a general idea. So three types of the skulls, not going to go deeper. So there's another thing, a widest part of the face. Yeah, you can see these definitely these two faces are not the same. I mean, like you learn one face and then you go like, well, wait a minute. You know, I can't find that face that I learned, this average kind of neutral idealized face. I don't see them. Of course you don't see them because there is no such thing. It's just like this medium, you know, this just arithmetic kind of uh, uh, average person. There's no average guy, average guy Joe. Well, but if you understand this average proportions, you always see in which direction the, the shift on the spectrum you, you see. So you always can understand. So you need to make the zero point and uh, 3d guys know everything about the zero points especially those who do uh, 3d printing 
how what happens if you lose the zero then it goes like oh my god oh my god there was one guy who was building cnc machines and he woke uh, once he woke in the night and he was screaming i lost the zero and he's wife like it's just a dream don't worry you have zero so this average person or neutral or kind of this medial kind of person that's a zero for you and that's it there is no better worse you know it's just zero and obviously you can see the the guy on the, the right hand side and the guy on the left hand side they have different sizes uh, different proportions of the face and here as well you know so more narrow more brachio brachiocephalic mm -hmm. uh, and here as well so where this widest part of the face actually is located like anatomically so where you can find it so somewhere on the cheek yeah but exactly where on the cheek so there is anatomical place where this place is actually located and it's in between where these two bones meet the temporal bone and the zygomatic bone they meet they meet on a bridge so there is a bridge they they're coming from one side and other side and they meet on top of the bridge and this top of the bridge is usually the widest part of the face so let's see how much time do we have left i still have some so uh and this place called zygomatic arch, as I mentioned, so it's it's kind of like a, you can call it a cheekbone as well. But the cheekbone is very kind of a, um, washed term because you know when the girls drawing the cheekbones, they know precisely exactly where the cheekbone have to be drawn. Uh, but they know it by heart. But anatomically, it's good to know anatomically because if you draw it correctly, you can give this uh, uh, slimmer appearance yeah that's a whole knowledge girls are very smart in anatomy but and they know how to trick us so in between these two, these two bones so the zygomatic arch it is the like a bridge over some kind of hollowness and why do we need this bridge we need this bridge because there is important muscle called temporalis muscle that going under the bridge and grabs the mandible and this muscle basically keeps our mouth shut. That's the main job it does. It doesn't even do chewing so much. Of course, it does some like mastication, yeah. but the most of all, it does. It keeps mouth shut. Yeah, and that's important thing to have this uh, muscle to keep your mouth shut sometimes, especially for me because I like to talk. Good that I have this uh, legit way of uh, speaking out. I like here. So temporal is muscle. Uh, we all know it. It occupies big part of the of the temple. So basically, it creates partly creates this roundness. You know, as bigger muscle you have, as rounder head you have, not only because of the skull but also muscle. You remember this, uh, the uh, Andrew Loomis when he chopped away the sides. So basically, those sides where he chopped away, that's the places where temporal muscle is located. And as and then we put it back the the volume. So mandible, mandible. That's the only bo moving bone of the of the skull. Uh, there is little things also need to be mentioned need to be uh, mentioned about the, about the, about the mandible as well. Uh, the most important thing in a mandible is a gonal angle. So again, this picture of the newborn, uh, like kind of like a child or teenager. Then you have adult, and then you have the elderly person and uh, of course massive joes small joes feminine joes masculine joes but you always have to understand what this term means and uh, one of the important things is this gonal angle so as you can see like uh, the adult male is the most steepest gonal angle and uh, most pronounced and when you get older it kind of opens up and the same thing when you're born so it's very small gonal angle because there is no pressure on the gums meaning that there is no pressure also on to the to the to the bony structures um, supporting it like uh, maxilla and 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 uh, mand and mandible and uh, and then it kind of starts to steeping up and of course uh, if you learn about like the uh, feminine and masculine features uh, the jaw is one of the first things that you kind of thinking about and as you can see on this picture, definitely, when, if you learn everything about the jawline and jaws, jaw is not the name, by the way, uh, then uh, then you kind of don't uh, 
if you if you're men and you're looking in a mirror and sculpt yourself usually then you girls when you sculpt the women characters they also tend to be more masculine and the same thing with the women if they sculpt masculine characters they used to make them more masculine or feminine sorry so just very simple when you look from the front you have these two points these eminences these these are two angles and on a, on a female one or more rounded very simple and the dif like distance between the lower lip and uh, and the jaw as well so th we have the masculine features and the feminine features and uh, going back referring back to the gonal angle as you can see the on a male the, in this this green line or this uh, ramus of the of the mandible is more steeper on a female is more more it's more like one this kind of line and you don't leave the angles when you sculpt the, the female you want to make them more feminine you just uh, try to avoid uh, angles because later on your female will look more masculine because of these angles because the female body is more you know rounded and more smooth and of course the front part of the of the mandible is much wider because of these two points remember and the one point or the smaller uh, on a male it will be will be much much wider and of course uh, I promised already you about this aging thing and how does it changes in age so um, basically if you don't replace your teeth with uh, with the prosthetics uh, there is not enough pressure on on the maxilla and the mandible and the body starts kind of taking away the the bone manner because if you don't use it we will use it somewhere else same thing like with astronauts. If they don't walk, they're losing like the strength of the bones. Same thing happens here. So just advice. If you lose the teeth, replace it as soon as possible because uh, it might be you might lose this yellow area, which is called alveolar processes, where the bones are kind of set in. So basically, you don't have teeth and you don't have structure where the teeth being being located. So you don't even have options to to um, uh, to where these prosthetic uh, teeth have to be put in. So always, uh, years, years, many years ago, we made this GIF, like, I don't know, 10 years ago. And I think it re very much well represents the mechanics, how, uh, what happens, not only with the, with this um, alveolar processes, but also, as you can see, the the gonal angle is changing because it uh, when you lose the yellow part you need to somehow maintain the connection between the upper and lower part and that's why it kind of opens up and then you have this very strange elderly person's look and of course when you're born here you lost the alveolar processes and when you're born you didn't even had it so because there is no teeth no need very simple uh, next, the temporal line. You all know the temporal line. The temporal line is the borderline between the roof, temple, and the forehead. Well, if you look at the person, sometimes you can see the, you know, the temporal line. But if you look at the female, you don't see the, the temporal line. But you have to think about as if it was there. Anatomically, there is, but it's not very pronounced. But you have to kind of draw the lines draw the borders in order to navigate in this organic chaotic world as I mentioned in, in the beginning so you need to kind of if there is no border you have to draw it yeah and that's why these head blockouts are very handy because you can always leave these you know borders even if there is no one you know the thing like when you look at the sea you know you see the horizon line horizon line what is the thickness of horizon line there is no thickness of horizon line. Maybe there is no line. Maybe it's just a place where the skies and the sea meets. Oh yeah, you're right. You know, but why we talk about the horizon line as a line? Because we have to separate one from other. We have to draw the border between these two things. And same thing with the with the blockouts. So you want to make these kind of rough divisions in order to keep in control of your organic chaos. So that's why I think these blockouts and learning blockouts is very, very handy. Uh, okay, uh, there's two temporal lines, actually. There is superior and inferior. Just in case if some doctor asks you, hey, temporal line? You mean superior or inferior? Hey, Zarin, you didn't tell me about these two lines. 
you told me about one. And now I kind of, uh, everybody, every doctor is laughing about me. Well, there is two lines. You don't see the inferior line because that's the place where the muscle is connected. Superior line is the place where the fascia of the muscle is connected. Again, too much information. A little bit about like the frontal bone. So there is two landmarks. Some of them already been mentioned in the previous lecture. Superciliary arches. Basically, there's a bro line, uh, bro ridge. So there's a combination of these two, uh, uh, these two uh, cashew nut form kind of uh, guys and the glabella. Basically, sometimes it really creates like kind of like a wing shape line. And that's the uh, that is a masculine feature. So basically, as bigger uh, bro bro lines you make, as more masculine uh, appearance uh, the character will have. Uh, and frontal eminences is the female uh, bony landmark. As bigger frontal eminences you make, as more feminine appearance you will get to the character. And it doesn't mean uh, that female don't have bro lines, uh, bro ridges, or f uh, men don't have uh, the frontal eminences. I'm just talking about the proportions. The female have much bigger frontal eminences and the men usually especially if they are very sporty kind of like a BMW driving persons they have these bro lines of course and uh, uh, as on also on the, on the children you have more feminine features present especially like this case with the African you can see how round forehead is and how childish and how kind of like feminine look at it of course it's a girl but it can be also a boy with a very round forehead and when Probably, uh, if it's a it's a boy when he grew up, probably he loses this roundness if he becomes more masculine. And here is a good picture the, in comparison, so you can see that how steep and how big the the jawline is, and and also the forehead, the forehead shape. Uh, you have the brow ridge, and then you have this um, this uh, frontal eminence on the left hand side. And I think this picture is lovely. I always show it because. You can see the roundness and the flatness of the on the male's face. There's one little detail that usually I don't mention in the lectures to not, don't mess it up with the kids. Is that if you look from above, it's opposite. Female have uh, female have actually much flatter, and the male has more rounder. You know that's but that's too much information because today I don't tell you too much I just tell a little bit so I can uh, uh, I think I think I can afford to tell you a little bit more confusing information that usually I do um, and of course you get like the masculine features on a female especially if there's a lot of if the person is doing a lot of sports because it, it is tightly connected to the to the hormones tightly connected to the testosterone because female also have testosterone yeah and uh, and of course, if you look at the guys, you might get more feminine features as well. So these are the things that you can play with to give the character more feminine or masculine features. So you don't want to always go, okay, man looks like this, woman looks like that. No, you can combine. You can give more feminine in top, more masculine in the bottom. You can change, you can play. Uh, look at the uh, occiput, look at the occiput. So. Uh, it gives sensitive appearance to the person. If the person is very sensitive, even if it's a man, you have much bigger, uh, much you want to make much bigger occiput. Those persons are very sensitive. Uh, it doesn't consider to be a feminine feature. It is a unisex, unisexual feature. So sometimes men are also sensitive, okay? <laughs> External occipital protuberance. That's the last uh, bony landmark that I wanted to mention. I still ha will have some uh, time for questions and answers, and uh, luckily, uh, because uh, my team said me, just you always have to leave some time for questions and answers. Okay, I will do that. So then that's why I ran through the lecture much quicker than I, I can also stand and talk for hours about like external occipital protuberance and nuchal superior nuchal lines and stuff like that. We don't have so much time. So that's the bone on the back side on your occiput is a little sharp bone it's usually on a man it's more prominent on a female it's less prominent but sometimes female also has much more prominent that's a thing that connects the basically uh, nuchal this ligament uh, that protects you from dying when you jump in, uh, into the lake 
uh, if it's very shallow water because we have this sport in Latvia that in the springtime when it's first warm day all guys drink too much beer and they jump into the lake and most of them they get paralyzed or die uh, <laughs> And, uh, and then there is this nuchal ligament that actually protects all of them, so not 100% die. So basically this ligament kind of protects uh, this movement, yeah? So basically a stronger neck you have, as bigger bone protrusion you have on the backside. Uh, also it can be et et uh, ethnical differences, you know, some uh, uh, like racial nationalities have more protrusions and less. So, and also uh, if you look pal paleolithic uh, like skulls, you can find very pronounced these. Uh, these uh, external uh, protuberance. And then you can see these blue, two blue lines. Those are superior nuchal line. Basically why this line is so important. Because that's the place where the neck is actually connected to the skull. And sometimes you have a hard time to understand where does neck connect to the skull. And then if you measure from the bottom of the neck, if you draw the line, yeah, but not sorry, button, button of the, uh, button of the orbit, the floor or the orbit. You draw the line above the external, this uh, and this um, external meatus, um ear canal, yeah, and and then you basically uh, uh, when on the end of the on the on the back side of the skull, you get the place where the neck is connected to the skull. That's another lecture. I have whole lecture about these drawing skulls and blah blah blah. I just wanted to mention because we have more time. So I can tell a little bit more information. And if you look from the back, these two lines, the nuchal lines, those are kind of creating the attachments of the trapezius muscle on the back side. So this red line actually represents like the floro, the orbit, the ear canal, external occipital protuberance. That's the place where the neck is connected to the, to the skull. Oh, and sometimes when I'm waiting in line in the gas station, I make pictures. So these are not those pictures because my pictures, when I usually make are like, like this, and they are kind of not used, you cannot use them. But I found that in the internet there is a big deficit of good occiputs and good, the, the, you know, you don't find the good backsides. Yeah, that's a big problem. That's why, that's why I made like the whole book about like the, you know, the form of the head and neck and I very like carefully paid attention to the, to the occiput because I personally as a sculptor, I'm missing that part. And, and usually when I make books, I usually make them as if I would make them for myself and I use them in my practice. So that's my little secret trick about, uh, about like making of books for anatomy for sculptors. This is my email just in case you want to reach me and ask some questions and if there is some like offline questions uh, you're uh, open to ask yeah <laughs> no questions yeah hi first of all thank you for your book i bought your book appreciate it Yeah, then I need some animator in the team. Okay, because uh, I, I kind of, uh, I, I'm a bottleneck in a company because I can make books about the things that I understand and know. And uh, I, uh, if I have like a person that is very good in, in uh, animation, then we can collaborate. Yeah, that's a, definitely would be a very useful book for that. I have requests also about animal anatomy. Yeah, and I totally, one day when I retire maybe, I will study more animal anatomy and then uh, I will be able to, uh, to, you know, but first before we, uh, I, I uh, get into the animal anatomy, there is still these kind of like series that uh, we had this series on the head and neck and now uh, we are launching in the 1st of November, we're launching campaign, Kickstarter campaign on the upper limb. We, and uh, and the next book after will be the lower limb and and then it's time for animation and animal anatomies but we have to cover the human anatomy first and anatomy because anatomy for sculptors that's how we call ourselves so so when you name yourself you have to somehow stick with that in some sense 
So uh, yeah, you're welcome to uh, to uh, to subscribe to get news about the Kickstarter campaign. And if there is any other questions, by the way, I have some books with me. In case if you have some cash, you can just you buy with a very uh, good discount of books from from us. But a very limited amount because I just took one bag with me. <laughs> but yeah, if you have any questions about like anatomy for sculptors and anything, that that would be uh, this is a good moment to ask. Of course, if you want to ask me some private questions, of course, then you meet me after afterwards. But uh, if you have any, yes. 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 Yeah. We'll go, uh, the, the, you know, the basically butt is the part either of torso, either of the lower limb, so we can decide. So probably the lower limb, and then we'll cover the butt. And also we're working on a 3D viewer, so you can really see the in 3D the, our reference, because book is good, of course, but sometimes you want to look from the, uh, all sides. And yesterday there was an idea about this, um, how you call it? What's the name? Yeah, that name. Yeah, so we would probably want to publish, and you can download and use those meshes as a, as a base mesh or whatever, how you call it. As I said, I'm not very good in 3D, so I sculpt, of course, uh, from the desperation, but uh, I'm not uh, so much into the thing, because there is so much thing about anatomy I have to think then. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Do we still have time? Still have three minutes. No questions, then we can just... Uh, so I'll set you free. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much.